Mr. President, Secretary General of the United Nations, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Government of the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka, I congratulate Your Excellency on your election as the President of the 67th Session of the United Nations General Assembly. Your proven skills and charming personality leave no room for doubt that under your able leadership we will achieve our goals for this session. Sri Lanka is also pleased to endorse the theme proposed by you for this year's high-level debate. The United Nations has provided the premier forum for 67 years for the resolution of international disputes and the negotiation of landmark global goals. In the conduct of international relations, Sri Lanka, a founding member of the non-aligned movement, firmly upholds the tenets of peaceful coexistence, mutual respect for each other's sovereignty and territorial integrity, non-interference in the internal affairs of other states, and equality and mutual benefit. Sri Lanka believes that in the settlement of international disputes, action must be based on the fundamental principle of sovereign equality of states, a principle firmly enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations. The noticeable recent tendency to selectively and arbitrarily intervene in the internal affairs of states flies in the face of this principle and dilutes the confidence so carefully nurtured in the United Nations system. Mr. President, the global financial crisis has posed a major challenge to the entire international community. In this context, it is of the greatest importance to ensure that any strategies employed to achieve recovery do not impose unjustifiable burdens on developing countries as they strive to achieve better living conditions for their people. A recovery without uplifting the developing countries simultaneously will be, by its very nature, unsustainable. It is paradoxical that it is the same countries where the financial crisis originated which now seek to provide policy prescriptions for others. It is noted that many countries of the South have weathered the financial storm successfully. Sri Lanka's economy, which has been carefully managed during this period, is one of the Asian economies which have recorded, by any standard, impressive gains. A growth rate of 8.2% was achieved in 2011. Since the end of the conflict in 2009, the areas formerly controlled by terrorists, the northern province, recorded a 27% GDP growth in 2011. The exponential boom in agriculture and fisheries in particular has contributed substantially to this result. Mr. President, we are now at a significant juncture in human history when climate change looms as the greatest challenge to the very existence of humanity. Many developing countries, including my own, are still struggling to regain lost opportunities and to improve the livelihood of their people while staring global warming in the face. Our carbon footprint remains negligible. It is imperative that the developed world deliver on its solemn undertakings to assist developing countries as we seek the common goal of arresting climate change caused by human-induced causes. Mr. President, the United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development, Rio Plus 20, held in June this year, demonstrated convincingly the efficacy of United Nations processes. The potential of the green economy, however, will be less attractive if we do not clearly understand its long-term consequences at a national level on sustainable economic strategies. The transition to a green economy must not generate negative externalities that would retard economic growth, perpetuate societal inequity and poverty. Assistance to developing countries under North-South Development Cooperation mechanisms must take into account global initiatives to mitigate the adverse consequences of too rigid an application of green economic principles. The efforts of developing countries themselves in this regard 
must be recognized and further facilitated. As member states of the United Nations, we must respect the principles patiently negotiated by the international community. These are principally the equality of rights, the equal sovereignty of all states, and the right to development as underlined in the Rio Plus 20 outcome document. The interests of the developing world must be entrenched and protected. Hence, no constraining conditions should be applied to development models or approaches adopted by member states which could prevent the achievement of sustainable development together with the eradication of poverty. Mr. President, the middle-income countries are the main driving force for strengthening our global economy. Sri Lanka's balanced socio-economic policy strategies propelled us to middle-income status a few years ago. As we have repeatedly emphasized, the entry of countries to middle-income status does not, by itself, provide a resolution to the issue of poverty and other developmental challenges. I wish to mention, in particular, that Sri Lanka employs a unique development strategy that empowers citizens with special attention to so social development needs. It has continued to achieve transformational change in the lives of its people by effectively mobilizing available resources and through the delivery of sustainable and citizen-centered programs. Sri Lanka has emphasized synergistic interactions between healthcare and education, public infrastructure development, including improved water and sanitation, transport and communication, especially under an integrated regional development approach, which we consider to be important. We enjoy, as well, a 98% literacy rate, with the score for girls being even higher. The success of this strategy is reflected in Sri Lanka's high ranking in the Human Development Index, of which we are legitimately proud. Sri Lanka has achieved many of the MDGs and is well on track to realize all of them by 2015, including the eradication of poverty. Eradicating poverty and improving the quality of life of our people has been the cornerstone of social development policies in Sri Lanka over many decades. Sri Lanka's key policy document, the Mahinda Chintana, Vision for the Future, has set specific targets to combat poverty within the MDG framework. A range of projects has been designed for the eradication of poverty by the year 2016. Through Gamanaguma and Divinaguma programs, dealing with village awakening and the upliftment of livelihoods and incomes, we have been addressing rural poverty eradication and ensuring food security. These programs continue to promote the concept of self-employment, directing financial and technical assistance to youth and women in rural areas, including those, those who suffered from the terrorist conflict. Mr. President, the contribution of women in Sri Lanka's successful realization of most of the MDGs is of great significance. Women being literate also encourage their children to focus on education and aspire to high goals. It is through the participation of women that Sri Lanka has been recognized for its achievements in the WHO breastfeeding promotion and immunization programs. I note with great pride that Sri Lanka produced the first elected woman prime minister in the world in the year 1960. We have made genuine efforts to ensure that the fruits of economic development are equally distributed and are accessible, especially to the most vulnerable segments of society. We have ensured that social mobility is not confined to the privileged in the towns and cities of the island, but penetrates deep into the rural hinterland. Three years ago, Mr. President, our government ended the terrorist challenge largely through its own efforts. Sri Lanka is firmly committed to redressing the grievances of all parties affected by the internal conflict. After the release of the report of the Lessons Learned and Reconciliation Commission, a local mechanism set in place by His Excellency the President of Sri Lanka, an action plan to give effect to its recommendations expeditiously has been adopted. 
a comprehensive national action plan for human rights with specific timelines has been approved by the Cabinet of Ministers. The government has also proposed a transparent and democratic process under the Parliamentary Select Committee to address post-conflict reconciliation issues. This initiative has been regrettably delayed by some opposition parties failing to nominate their representatives. Sri Lanka, Mr. President, ex exemplifies the challenges faced by a society emerging from the shadow of a sustained conflict which spanned three decades and is now entering upon an era of peace and tranquility. The gradual diminution of these challenges and the brevity of the period which has elapsed since the end of the conflict leave no room for doubt as to the degree of success achieved by the government of Sri Lanka in respect of a wide range of issues relating to development and reconciliation. It is only about three years since the conflict ended. Prioritization was a central feature of the government's plan of action. The progress on the ground during the last three years with regard to the resettlement of internally displaced persons, the reintegration into society of thousands of ex-combatants after exposure to programs of livelihood skills training, which equipped them to earn their living with dignity and independence, the rapid completion of the demining process and the unprecedented focus on infrastructure development leading to visible invigoration of the economy of the island as a whole and the northern province in particular is quite apparent. The experience of Sri Lanka demonstrates that given the quality of dynamic leadership and unwavering commitment which His Excellency President Mahindra Rajapaksa provided an effective political and military strategy and strong rapport with all sections of the public, it is possible to prevail against the most ruthless forces of terror. No one has greater commitment, Mr. President, to reconciliation in an all-inclusive spirit than our government. Unhelpful external pressures that support narrow partisan interests could easily derail the initiatives which have produced very substantial results and peace on the ground as we begin a new an exciting chapter in our country's history. In the international community's quest to bring some semblance of equity in economic development across continents, we must maintain increased focus on the continent of Africa, especially through South-South cooperation. Sri Lanka is expanding its engagement vigorously with the region, especially in matters relating to trade, investment, tourism, and technical assistance. Mr. President, all our current endeavors should seek a stronger focus on children and youth who are the custodians of our future. We have continuously supported UNJ Resolution 66-6 and the need to end the unjust economic, commercial and financial embargo against Cuba. Unilateral sanctions of this nature which harm ordinary people should have no place in modern international intercourse. Terrorism, Mr. President, remains a scourge in the contemporary world. It threatens our societies and impedes the socio-economic progress of our people. As a country which has emerged from ruthless and brutal terrorism, Sri Lanka continues resolutely to support all multilateral efforts to enhance peace and security and eliminate all forms of terrorism without discrimination. In our collective quest, to eradicate terrorism, the selective application of principles and double standards must be scrupulously avoided. Terrorism from wherever it emerges must be unequivocally condemned and counteracted. It is established that terrorism has developed close links with transnational organized crime in the form of cybercrime and identity theft, environment-related crime, maritime piracy, smuggling of migrants, and trafficking in persons and drugs. Maritime piracy has emerged as a major threat to international sea lanes and has added an additional economic burden to global trade. Sri Lanka, as a trading nation for centuries, supports with all enthusiasm multinational efforts to counter this threat. But it is to be remembered that piracy originates on land 
And any solution to piracy must also address its causes and developments on land. The illicit transportation of migrants to greener pastures overseas by criminal networks requires our collective attention. Sri Lanka also continues to cooperate closely in this regard with our bilateral and multilateral partners. As a member of the Bali process, we are committed to cooperation in capacity building, the exchange of best practices and law enforcement cooperation. At the same time, we do believe that the necessity to share information in good faith, acknowledging that a variety of national interests of member countries is essential to counter effectively the sophisticated human smuggling rings. One long-standing issue that weighs on the conscience of the international community and which needs our sustained collective attention is the restoration of the inalienable rights of the Palestinian people. Sri Lanka fully supports the implementation of all relevant UN resolutions on Palestine that would pave the way for the achievement of statehood for the Palestinian people and bring lasting peace to the region. Sri Lanka fully supports Palestine in its efforts to achieve full membership of the United Nations. Sri Lanka, Mr. President, unreservedly condemns the defamation of all religions and religious leaders. While the right to free speech is fundamental to our value system, that right should not be abused to hurt the feelings of the faithful, whether they be Buddhists, Muslims, Christians, Hindus, Jews, or followers of other faiths. All available mechanisms must be employed to prevent the defamation of all religions and the exploitation of religious symbols for commercial purposes. In conclusion, Mr. President, Sri Lanka is currently in the process of making arrangements to host the World Youth Conference in 2014. The primary objective will be the strengthening of youth inclusion in national decision-making processes in relation to the development and implementation of the post-2015 development agenda. I extend an open invitation cordially to all fellow member states to join hands with us to make this global event a success. I thank you, Mr. President.